I mean, thank you all for sticking around. I don't know about these secrets, but uh, I thought, listening to some of the other talks this morning, everyone has kind of a very close perspective looking at, at details of projects, and I thought I would take the, uh, the 10,000 foot view of things. And uh, so in the next 45 minutes, I would cover the entire history of paint, and um, which is oftentimes considered the other oldest profession. And, uh, but rather than talk about uh, commerce and uh, technology, I thought I would um, look at paint as a uh, kind of magical substance. Um, human beings are the only ones who are capable of, uh, that, I'm, that everyone's aware of, of symbolic thought, of imbuing uh, objects with meaning. And paint is probably the easiest medium uh, to do that with. Um, we're all consumers of visual impressions. Um, we come across thousands of them uh, uh, every day, and the way that we consume impressions, uh, you know, usually through through painted, you know, through color and, and texture and objects, uh, um, is not well understood. The psychology of paint, the psychology of color, the psychology of, of design. Uh, we live in a world where the awareness and sophistication of visual information is at an all-time high, especially with digital and computer graphics and industrial design which permeates every aspect of our life. Everything is designed and, and composed in a certain way. So our knowledge is, is greater, but uh, because we're bombarded with this visual stimulus all the time, uh, we've become somewhat uh, visually illiterate. And uh, we feast on visual stimulation to the point of overload. We've, we've lost the art of carefully uh, uh, looking and seeing. I've spent my entire life, I was trained as an artist, you know, trying to see more, trying to see relationships, uh, try to see underneath the surface of things, even though it's the surface of things that we're concerned with. Um, there's an interesting uh, professor, uh, Jen Roberts at Harvard, she teaches in the, uh, 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 in the department which teaches teaching there, and she requires her students to go to a museum and spend three hours in front of a painting. That's the requirement just look at, some, at an individual object of painting for three hours and see what they can see. And I guarantee you that if you spend three hours in front of an object, it could be a building, it could be a, a piece of artwork, you begin to see more and more and more. And instead, there's probably a few people with their computers on, you know, this is, this is how we consume information, right? You know, two seconds, a little, a little tweet, you know, five seconds, and our, and our ability to see is diminishing, our ability to understand. So I, I want to take, as I said, not the, the detailed look at the specifications, what paint's made out of, how it's applied, what the economics are, what's the industry, although I, I have studied paint chemistry and, and, and understand the application of paint, I wanted to pull back a little bit and look at it more, somewhat more philosophically. Um, so, you know, and, and as I said, this uh, professor, Jen Roberts, calls it uh, uh, learning to de decelerate. Um, so, let's see here. That's me. Uh, our learning objectives increase our understanding of the history of paint, knowledge of the various ways in which paint has been used, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, and we're going to, so, but the first impulses Paint is magical. Before anybody used paint on their environment, they used it on themselves. Uh, it's painting by Catlin, uh, uh, someone in, in, in Africa here, uh, Amazon, and uh, Braveheart. We covered ourselves with it, and paint was magical, and it still is, and we've lost the, that, that distinction of, of, of how to use it that way or how to understand it that way, uh, modern camouflage. Uh, it may be a little bit uh, trite to go back to the cave paintings, but there's something, to, I, I've been to these different sites, I've seen these paintings, I'm interested in rock art, and what relevance does that have to do with modern coatings? And I'll, 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 I'll come to that. Uh, so this is 22,000 years old, Altamira in Spain uh, uh, spanned 4,000 years, 9,000 9, years to 13,000 years, and having seen it, they were using the same imagery and the same techniques. We don't know whether it meant the same thing, but they were making images, similar images, over a 4,000-year period of time. And when you think about us with 
uh, the way we consume images now and, and, and the speed with which our perception is changing, our perception of our surroundings, the way we, the way we see surroundings, uh, it's quite astonishing to contemplate that, that human beings, probably not that much different than you and I, uh, in terms of, you know, were for 4,000 years making the same images in the same location uh, because of, 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 of what they represented. So here's India 25,000 years ago, um, Lascaux in, in France, which if you've, any of you have been to Lascaux, uh, has been completely replicated. The entire cave system was reproduced as, 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 as a, 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 a palmaset for the original. You can't see the original because it was being damaged by the breath of all the visitors, so they replicated the entire thing over a 15-year period of time. And the power of that art, and it, it, it will, does move you. It does, you know, you feel something when you go in there. There's a mystery there uh, that, that is very palpable, even in the, even in the reproduction. So what are the uh, universal formalistic principles? There are certainly uh, principles of design and color which are understood culturally and which change over time. What interests me is what are the principles that hold true for uh, regardless of the time or the culture, uh, and, the, and, and so you can break them down into these very, a few, these are a few of the components. Value, contrast, color, scale, texture, pattern, form, rhythm, composition. The same elements which we're talking about in this room, for instance. One could analyze this room, and perhaps at the end of the talk I'll, I'll do that, and just take a, a moment to see what can we learn from looking at this room, looking more closely, looking more deeply at, at what's around us and understanding it. Um, we can think about the scientific principles of color. 80% uh, of our neurocortex, that is our front lobal, front uh, uh, brain, is used uh, to process visual information. It's the principal way that we uh, interact with the world is through visual stimulation, much um, less so than uh, tactile or, or, or sound. So what do we know about it, all right? Uh, and they said if we can, we, we, we know the scientific principles of color, the visible light. We only see a small fragment of, of, the, of, the, of the wavelengths, which is visible light. Um, we see them through the receptors of our eyes, which are subjective. One of the things that sort of blew my mind is that everything that we see in this room, all the color, all the color that we talk about, really only happens in our mind. That's where it's translated. So that even though there is a scientific uh, uh, way that the light hits the surface, and whether we're looking at reflected light or illuminated light, and especially with computer screens, there's a, a huge transition now uh, from reflected light to illuminated light, which is a different way of perceiving. Uh, color can be thought of in terms of principles, the value, the color, the intensity, the chroma, the hue, and I'll talk more about that. I'm just giving a quick background so we, we have a context for the, putting this in, com in conversation. Uh, we can think about how colors change in atmospheric perspective through through the, the, the medium that we're seeing them through, and of course the relationships of colors and uh, simultaneous contrasts with one of the principles. Um, on the slide here, we have uh, the wavelength of, of uh, color, both warm and cool color, uh, at either end of the wa wavelength. So just to show how, these, how, how this is through history, have uh, uh, in in, in uh, Egypt, they had color. Uh, Domus Aureus, which was, Nepo which was uh, um, uh, Nero's pleasure palace, um, which was sacked and buried. It's next to the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, you can get a special permission to go see it. Uh, these, these prints are from the 1600s, and I'll explain their relevancy in a minute. Um, uh, the Aga Sophia, which was built initially in Constantinople, as uh, now Istanbul, as a Christian church. Uh, the Mago Caves, the caves of, of 10,000 Buddhists in the Silk Road in Xinjiang in Western China where I've been. Uh, and these are mysterious places. When you go in there, you feel something. Why? What is taking place? How do they understand, you know, again, my perspective is one of, this is the medium that we're working with, paint, pigment, but what, how is it used to express uh, uh, these ineffable qualities? Uh, the Alhambra, in, and, and, and I intend to bombard you with images here just to hopefully stimulate your frontal cortex. Uh, the Alhambra in Spain, 19th century Moors. 
um, Notre Dame de Tower in Toulouse, 14th century, um, Gothic, uh, medieval, um, then the Renaissance. So this is the Villa Madama uh, in uh, Rome by Raphael of 1524, which was, um, and what happened was that the Renaissance, they, just, they rediscovered uh, uh, the Domus Aureus, uh, Nero's pleasure palace, and it was hugely influential. I'm gonna go back a second. There it is. So this is what was discovered in, at the beginning of the Renaissance that basically sparked the classical revival uh, that still, we're still with us today. So this building by Raphael um, was based on the, on the Domus uh, Aureus. Uh, the conspiracy, this, and then I'm moving through, I'm going to go quickly through history here so I can get to the meat of this uh, talk. Um, conspiracy of Claudius Aurelius by Rembrandt in 1662, uh, which originally was supposed to be in the uh, city hall in Amsterdam, which is now the royal palace. Uh, it was removed within two years. Uh, uh, it was controversial. So all of the, what do the, all these have in common? They're all made with pigments. This is an image of the Holly Festival, uh, which is celebrated in the springtime in March in, in all throughout India uh, by the Hindus. It's, the, it, 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 uh, it's a spring festival where everyone puts color, they throw color on one another, and it has to do with uh, uh, Radna, uh, who is the lover of Krishna, the blue, blue god. Uh, and here's what it looks like, and if you've ever been, it is wild. Everyone throws color on everyone else. Uh, so the, a little bit about the history of pigments, and, 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 and which we get involved with. We have to know when pigments were made so that we can date various projects that we're working on. A uh, prehistory was basically iron oxide, uh, colors right out of the earth, and vegetal colors, uh, ochre, sienna, umber, lamp black, and chalk white. Very limited palette. The Egyptians started, uh, 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 they had discovered the glass blowing, so they could make color from glass, both blue, malachite green, and minerals, azurite, uh, and cinnabar red. The Chinese, uh, 2,000 years BC, started mixing mercury with sulfur and came up with vermilion. Um, Greeks and Romans invented uh, lead carbonate. Uh, they would take uh, lead that they mined, they'd pile animal dung on top of it, and then pour vinegar on top of it, and they would get lead carbonate, uh, which was our lead white. Uh, interesting dis way to discover how to make paint, right? You can only imagine. Uh, uh, 14th century, we learned to calcine those, those uh, earth colors, and we had burnt earth, terra verde, burnt uh, sienna, burnt umber, and, and, and even ultramarine. Uh, then with the Industrial Revolution, starting in the 1700s, uh, we had, they synthesized uh, uh, French ultramarine, Prussian blue, cobalt blue, um, uh, chrome yellow, cadmiums, you can see uh, the progression. And this has to do with our uh, bringing up to modern times. Uh, so when we work on old, old buildings and old paintings and we, and we do the uh, chromochronologies and we look at the colors in the microscope and we do the, uh, uh, the analysis of what the pigments are, we can tell when a painting or an object is from by dating the pigments. Um, Modern pigments, uh, the quinacridons, and the, um, you know, came about in the 50s when there was another wave of, of color changes. Uh, a lot was owed to the car industry for developing new pigments and new systems. And I'm not going to talk at all about binders, which is a whole other subject. I'm just going to talk about color and our perceptions. So here we have uh, pigments and the development of the palette. So that chronology of, of the development of pigment, which I just spoke about, this, these are some uh, some images of artist palettes from 1895 to 1905, and here are the actual palettes. So Delacroix was still working in what we would call an old uh, master's palette of earth tones. Uh, Van Gogh uh, pushed it a little bit, and the the artists are always the uh, uh, in the avant-garde of perception that it, that then filters down to the masses, and this happens today as well. So. Uh, but what influenced the Impressionist and, their, and the, that color revolution that happened at the end of the 19th century? Here's Gauguin's palette. Here's Monet's palette. So you see the colors are much brighter. Where did the, not only did they have new pigments, but the, uh, color was being consumed in a new way, and our perception of colors was changing at the end of the 19th century. Uh, this is probably Monet's palette. 
what it was comprised of, uh, cadmium, vermilion, alizarin lake. Some of the colors weren't very permanent. Some were more permanent. Um, here's uh, the installation of Monet's lilies at the Museum de Lange in, in, in Paris. Um, spectacular room. And again, what interests me is when you go into this room and you, if I can put it this way, consume the colors, the impressions of these paintings, it affects you in a way that is, in my mind, not any different than all of those earlier examples I gave of the caves in, in, in Lascaux. You know, what is the effect of paint, either subtle or subconscious or psychological? And as I said, you, one can think of it in two ways. Uh, what's culturally acquired, um, you know, what's of our times, what have we learned about pain, but also what are the universal principles that, that, and how they affect us. Um, Cezanne, uh, and, they be, and, and, and Seurat was one of the first people to understand some of the scientific principles of color, simultaneous contrast, and uh, by using pointillism, I'm sure you all are familiar with this, uh, and having the eye a blend of those colors together in the brain to create uh, the image. So this is a, a painting made of a series of, of, of colors, but it's the combination of the colors in our brain that creates the image. Uh, and Vuillard also took the same theory. Of course, Vuillard was uh, uh, influenced greatly by the uh, Oriental art, Japanese and Chinese art, which during the Edo period was was coming to the United uh, coming to the uh, Europe, visa the uh, decorative prints and heretofore unknown art. So let's talk about some of those influences. What are the influences of the Industrial Revolution on color and design? This is uh, Frederick Edwin Church's house that he built up in Hudson, New York, Olana, which was a, a Moorish fantasy filled with decorative painting, stenciling, gilding. A wonderful place if you ever have a chance to visit it. Uh, and at the same time, the late 1800s, there was a phenomenon, there, a chromolithography was a, a technological ad, uh, um, advance in printing. So they were able to print books, pattern books, in uh, this much wider range of colors. And the question is, which came first? Did the, uh, did the Impressionists uh, change the way that we think about color and expand our color range? Or did technology, uh, and the chromolithography showed that there was a broader range of colors which then the artist uh, exploited. So, uh, but the pattern books were very interesting because they exposed uh, the greater uh, public to all of the various, uh, they were generally organized by stylistically, Egyptian, Grecian, Roman, Byzantine, uh, Phoenician, Persian, etc. So here's some uh, examples of the pattern books of the day. Uh, whose influence is still being felt now. Owen Jones in his Grammar of Ornament and it was a, a philosophy which I uh, 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 agree with, which is that all of this visual impressions can be thought of as a language and that there are hierarchies of, uh, you know, in the same way that we have syntax, we have grammar, we have, you know, uh, the, the, the smallest building c components, which is phonics and uh, 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 letters, but the most eloquent expression, at least in language, would be the poetic expression. So if all of these uh, elements which I'm discussing, the design elements which I showed earlier, uh, pattern, color, relationships, composition, rhythm, uh, value, can be uh, thought of as a hierarchy, what is the grandest expression? I would, I would say that it would be mural, murals would be the, the penultimate expression, narrative, pictorial imagery. Um, and so here's uh, August Racinet, who came out with the four volumes of, of pattern books, uh, late 1800s. Uh, the Audsley brothers did a series of pattern books out of Scotland, uh, dealing with neo-Grec neo and uh, neo-Gothic. And um, uh, A.W. Pugin, also 1850s, 1860s, uh, was a great champion of the neo-Gothic. Now, I, I'm gonna give a few examples of projects which I've worked on where we've seen this influence. This is um, the Grace Church of John, 1848. Uh, and there's a, something uh, interesting here as well. So this is a, a historic photograph decorating, decoration which stems from 1868. And notice the color of the ceiling, it's light, which uh, is, a, is a key. So we knew there was decoration on the ceiling. We knew we could see some patterns back here. Uh, 
well. We can see a little bit of a pattern here. This is how we were, what we found when we went in. It was completely painted white. The ceiling was just dark wood, wood grain. Uh, and uh, this is what it looks like now. But how did we find that out? We started to, we, we looked at the colors under the microscope um, in cross section. We found that the chromochronologies corresponded with the, the uh, history of the church when it said that they were decorated at certain periods. Uh, it was plain when it was painted in 1848, major decoration in 1868, decorated again in the 1890s, and then starting a series of, of devolutions of painting it out white, uh, which are these upper layers here, all the white layers uh, starting in the 1930s and after the Second World War. Uh, so we, we started to go back and wash off the wood graining on the ceiling, and we found a great discovery that and it was distemper paint. There was a, uh, many churches were painted, and many buildings were painted before the advent of, of cans of paint and tubes of paint. Artists would make their own paint. They would take dry pigment, they'd mix it with uh, rabbit skin glue or hide glue, some type of animal glue, and they would create their paint on the job site and they would paint. And so all the wood graining was done that way. Uh, the idea of packaged paint came about after the uh, Civil War and during the Industrial Revolution. It was, but right up until the Second World War, uh, many uh, church painters would make their own paint. So we started looking at the, trying to do exposure windows, see what was underneath it, and lo and behold, there was the original ceiling, the 1868 ceiling, intact underneath the distemper, and all we had to do was wash off the distemper paint from the 1890s and find the original. And the uh, poetic metaphor for uh, the what, what the, the meaning of this particular church was a, the Garden of Eden. So there were this sprouted seed and all this decoration here. This is our rendering of what it would look like uh, after we'd done our research. So this was the Garden of Eden going up to uh, the celestial heavens. So it was a wonderful poetic metaphor for what the building meant. And fortunately, the client did put it all back. Now, uh, there's another project which we worked on many years ago, which was a, quite a, a, an interesting discovery. Um, when Napoleon uh, invaded Egypt in the beginning of 1805, I believe 1806, he brought with him an army of scientists um, uh, and, uh, who, and, and people who recorded both the flora, the fauna, the architecture, and it almost bankrupted the French government. It was the largest publication that had ever been undertaken up to that point. It was a thousand copies of a thousand pages of these lithographs uh, d descriptions of Egypt, and, it, and it, it, even after Napoleon was deposed, they kept printing it. It went on for about 25 years, um, and it had an enormous influence on, uh, in the 1820s, 1830s, uh, in Europe, uh, Biedermeier, uh, uh, Libertad. It was basically the seeds of modernism came from Napoleon's uh, uh, tours and, and what he brought back to Europe of, of Egypt. And, uh, and, and a wonderful example of that kind of Rosetta Stone, the, the missing link, if you will, in, in the evolution of, of, of art history, is this building Conception Abbey in Missouri, which was uh, built and painted in 1893. So in, in the 1840s, there were uh, two um, uh, artists in Munich, uh, uh, Lenz and Myers, who thought that the only way that they could really pursue their, their vision of art was if they became monks. They became Benedictine monks in the Boronese uh, order, which was uh, uh, centered in, in Boron in Switzerland. And they developed this style of art, which was, as I said, based largely on uh, Napoleon's uh, findings in Pharaonic Egypt. And they went to uh, northwest Missouri, to uh, uh, Mary's, near Ver Marysville, Conception, Missouri. It's in, the, it's in cornfields. And they built this magnificent Benedictine abbey and decorated it with Boronese art. And then during the Second World War, Monte Cassino and the, and the churches in Prague, which were done in the same, were all destroyed during the Second World War. So in the, in the middle of the cornfields in northwestern Missouri is this sort of missing link in the evolution of modernism. You know, here it is preserved in America. So we restored this, this, uh, uh, this monastery and it helped me understand you know, how the evolution. And, and we've also done a number of new projects. This is a project from a few years ago, uh, 2011, in Nebraska, in Kearney, Nebraska. It's a new church which we were involved in the design of from the conception, uh, done in the Boronese style. And uh, 
you know, taking these representations and, and, and applying them in modern architecture. Uh, I'm just going to show some examples of other projects we've been involved with to show how an understanding of the historical styles has influenced our work today. So this is uh, Felix Luftucker, um, uh, for the architect uh, Edward Weber, the Cathedral of St. Joseph's in Willing, West Virginia, done in chyme paint, uh, potassium silicate paint. I don't know if anyone's spoken about that here, but uh, uh, King Ludwig, the dream king of Germany in the 18... 80s, uh, the, the French had marble, the Italians had craftsmen, and he, he went to Otto Keim, who was a chemist, and said, invent me a paint that will last forever. And uh, he came up with a synthetic fresco paint based on potassium silicate, which is water glass, the same material as petrified wood. Um, and uh, this is one of the few examples of it in the United States, and there are buildings painted in uh, Stein am Rhein in Switzerland. Uh, which have, were painted in 1889 and 1890, never repainted. Uh, oops, I gotta keep going here. Church of the Ascension. I'm just going to bombard you with with images here, because uh, someone's already given me the signal that we've got a lot of a lot of ground to cover. This is a recent project at the Cathedral of of St. Joseph, Co-Cathedral in Brooklyn, um, where the literally the the paint, the paint literally has a, 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 a symbolic meaning. These are the uh, Loretta, uh, litany of Loretta. Uh, so people will come, and we, we've, we've done 26 murals here of the Virgin. So this will become a pilgrimage site for people to come and, and actually pray to, to the paintings that we've made. Um, Civitas, the, the Temples of Democracy, uh, the Columbian Exposition in Chicago, 1893, which launched the, the use of white paint in the United States and the misconception that the uh, neoclassical and our American Renaissance buildings were painted white uh, was basically came about largely because of the, the misconception of the Columbian Exposition, which supposed that classical architecture was white, when in point of fact, we know now that it was polychromed. And, and so uh, the Illinois State Capitol, uh, Alfred Picknard, uh, 1880, uh, 1868, and finished, right, worked on right up until the 1880s. Same architect for the um, uh, Iowa State Capitol. These are all projects which we've worked on, where we went back and, and did the chromochronologies, looked at them, did exposure windows, found the original paintings, did the research, understood what the artists and the architects originally intended, and put them back. Uh, Library of Congress, I spent seven years working on this building, um, uh, restoring all the artwork here. Uh, Cass Gilbert's Essex County Courthouse, 1904. And again, what are the modern applications? Uh, that's me painting uh, the Kentucky State Capitol, which was originally intended to have murals when it was built in uh, 1910. The artist who was supposed to do them took a fateful trip on a boat called the Titanic. So consequently, the paintings were never painted. And 100 years later, we went back and uh, uh, designed them and, and, and added them to the rotunda. Uh, we, we also do a lot of work on another kind of temple, the Temple of Entertainment, uh, theaters. Uh, this is the Sanger Theater in New Orleans, um, which, we, which we was badly damaged after Katrina, and we uh, restored it, did again the historic paint research, uh, understood. So here you have, in these buildings, the culmination of all of the decorative arts, the gilding, glazing, stenciling, pattern, uh, texture, uh, one can see how all of these things that I've just touched on come together to create these interiors, which have a transformative uh, uh, effect on the people who consume them by, you know, just in the same way as this room. Uh, Boston Opera House, Thomas Lamb, with uh, murals by Blashfield and Andorente, uh, the Pantages, which we restored after the earthquake, uh, uh, Northridge earthquake uh, in, in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, here's a, no more, another recent project. This is the Paramount Theater in Boston, which um, was essentially gutted in 1980, and all of the decoration was taken out. And so I wanted to show modern applications here. What we did is we went back, researched what, what it looked like originally, and essentially completely reconstructed this theater from nothing. And all the artwork that you see on the wall here, all of this repeated pattern, is now done digitally. So. Uh, there is a modern application for uh, 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 and then murals, as I said, I believe are the penultimate expression of uh, of the you know the painter's uh, craft, the artist's craft. 
Uh, these are WPA murals by African American artists at the Harlem Hospital. This is the condition they were in, uh, it's original. Uh, and we took them out of the building. They uh, uh, had to take the entire walls out there. Some of them weighed up to uh, 16 tons. Uh, bring them through the building, they tore the building down, they built a new building, and the murals went back in. And then the murals, the historic murals, became the imagery here printed on, on the glass, uh, f f became the, essentially the poster child for the new building with the, with the original murals reinstalled in the new building. Uh, some trompe l'oeil, I was supposed to talk yesterday with John Pugh, so I threw in a few trompe l'oeils that we did back in the 80s and 90s. Um, Bank of Chicago, uh, this is a mural we did for Richard Haas in 1985 and just finished uh, conserving last year. All paint, everything on that wall, is that's a blank wall. Uh, here's uh, homage to the uh, Emperor Cincinnatus on here in, here in Cincinnati. I painted this myself in 1983. Uh, unfortunately, it's been repainted several times and is somewhat in, in, in not such good shape now. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's just a few blocks from here. Uh, and I thought I would just touch on, how are we doing for time, okay? Okay, so I'm going to just go through this. So paint in the public realm, graffiti, all right? Uh, Coretta K Kent's uh, early uh, pieces of, of water towers in Boston, 1971. Uh, Banksy, graffiti is a crime. And I don't know if you all are familiar with the public artist graffiti, uh, uh, Banksy, but he's done some wonderful thought evocative pieces. So again, the power of paint. Uh, Kenny Scharf, a modern artist who uh, started as a graffiti artist, now is painting sell for millions of dollars. Um, I'm just going to run through these images. Uh, and here, the aqueduct murals at the aqueduct racetrack in, in New York, which were done by graffiti artists as a way to harness them in a, a, a more constructive way. Modern color theory. I want to get up to the present because that's what the, the, the point of it. Um, Modrian's early paintings from 1920. Uh, of course, Joseph Albers and his color theory and simultaneous contrast of colors. Oh, this is a project we're working on right now. And, and here's where these concepts, uh, the Eames House in Los Angeles, Eero Saarinen, um, again, you can see the similarities to the uh, uh, Modrian uh, paintings. And we're doing the color analysis on this one right now. And of course, the uh, Eames were the famous uh, uh, industrial designers who influence the way that we basically chair and furniture design. Now, this is a fascinating slide for me that I discovered some time ago. Everyone is familiar with Le Corbusier, but before Le Corbusier was Le Corbusier, he was Genere, and he did a vernacular architecture. So this is 1905, purely you know decorative architecture but done by Le Corbusier, and here's uh, La Habitation uh, in outside of Marseille where color is used on a modern building to reflect light into the apartments. Uh, Cesar Pelli, Los Angeles Design Center, Pacific Design Center, a, a wonderful use of color on the exterior buildings. And one of my all-time favorites, the Rothko Chapel uh, in Houston, 1970. So, and I visited this place and I felt the power of these paintings, which were essentially just black canvases. But when you go in there, and I'm not the only one who feels this, I think that many, many people uh, you're moved by these paintings in a way, and they're so simplistic, but there's so much depth in them. And so I asked myself, okay, what did he understand that he could paint these canvases that have the capacity to move thousands? Of, I mean, everyone, and this is not just unique to my psychology, that when people go in here, they feel something about the, uh, the depth of humankind or spirituality it actually has the power to affect all these people. So the mystery to me, going back to those early cave paintings, is what is the power of paint? How can one use paint to have a transformative experience? And, and it certainly, and, and, and as consumers of paint, in, you know, every day we see billboards, that's why I started with the billboard. Uh, you know, we're consuming paint, we, we're, we don't know how, we're, how it's affecting us. Can we understand it? Can we learn to see more? Can we, can we uh, break it down into those com component pieces, which I've tried to illustrate very quickly here, so that we can understand what the power of paint is and how to harness it and use it? So um, this is another project which we worked on, the Cathedral of Christ the Light in, uh, in Oakland. 
we did all these side rooms where they're just simple meditative chambers done in Venetian plaster, colored, so they have texture, but the, the color, and each one is a different color, uh, is supposed to have a psychological effect. When you go in there, you feel something. Now, there are places like the Color Institute uh, uh, in New York, which, pr which predicts each year what colors will be popular so that people can, you know, design their clothing around it. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, how do we perceive color in, in, the, in the digital age? These computer screens, which I'm looking at, this is what they're made out of. They're made out of three colors, uh, cyan, uh, uh, magenta, you know, it's, it's just three colors, but we perceive them as white. Uh, again, artists who are at the foreground of, of I believe, of looking and uh, perceiving and perception, you know, Chuck Close's self-portrait where he takes it apart, not unlike Seurat, but relating to how we perceive things in, in the digital age. And I believe that um, the digital age is going to have a, a, a revolution to our perception because now everything that we consume now, we even if you look at magazine layout design, it's based on the computer screen, no longer on the on the principles of of you know of how design was composed on a page. Everything that relates to a computer screen now, and our our perception of how things are changing is happening. We, we didn't have computers in 19 in the in. What was it? 1980s, we didn't really have this, so the, the whole digital age is, what, 20 years old, perhaps? And so where the, the cave painting, same, same perception over four or 5,000 years, now we're changing within a decade. And I think that, that we have to understand how we see things in order to uh, understand how they'll change and, and control that as opposed to just being, uh, uh, you know, taken by it and unconsciously consuming. Uh, so I think that's my last slide. Oh, one more. This is a new building in Miami. It's being built right now, uh, incorporating both, uh, you know, all these principles that I've talked about, uh, pattern, design, light, uh, and even graffiti in the, uh, in the lobby. So that was the history of paint in 45 minutes. I hope that you all got your fill. Thank you.